Thank you, Julie. And um, honestly, I can't, I can't imagine a better talk to follow, um, in part because I think not only was it fantastic, but it also, I think, was both complementary and contrasting in this really wonderful way. Um, that we would talk about delight and mindfulness uh, and, uh, and look at how we can do that in products in sort of a systemic way. Um, and then to be followed up with something like confrontation, which I hope you all feel something when, that, when you hear that word, because that's exactly what I'm hoping for. Uh, but first, I want to start with this word, growth. Uh, and as with every uh, journey in life uh, and journey in understanding, uh, when I wanted to figure out what growth meant, I started with Google. And through searches in here, and a lot of interesting stuff came up. Um, it seems that we, uh, you know, you can find stuff like this. Nine simple steps to exponentially grow your business. Uh, growth hacking. Um, I hope all of you have gotten on this train, because if not, you've missed, possibly missed a chance to transform your future. Uh, there's, uh, there's that kind of growth. Um, there's also 14 strategies to accelerate your personal growth by 1,000%. I definitely want to understand more about what, how you measure that and what that 1,000 um, really means. Um, you know, and then you see things like this, and I you know, just kind of I think this is really well intentioned, and of course there's substance in all of these articles, um, but even just this, like nine ways to be a better person in 2018. Um, and what I kind of come away with is that, okay, well one, we clearly value growth, and growth uh, is, you know, comes in many forms, and we value kind of all of these different forms. But a second thing is that it seems like we would love a shortcut. Right? We want the nine simple steps. We want the 14 strategies to get to the thousand percent and so forth. But as with, again, kind of all things in life, it's kind of like, all right, but what if, what if it ain't easy? Um, and I think more importantly, what if one of the strategies for growth is actually something that we've been conditioned to feel is not a good thing, right? Um, and what I'm speaking of specifically is this. I'm speaking of confrontation. I'm speaking of that feeling that I'm hoping, again, you're all viscerally getting when you see this word or when you think about it. And it makes sense because this is the definition of confrontation, a hostile or argumentative situation between opposing parties. It's at least one definition. Um, and yeah, when I read that, I start to feel like, uh-oh, like something bad is gonna happen. Um, but I came across this quote from Tim Ferriss, and I think it actually conveys the concept a lot um, better for me. Um, he says, a person's success in life can usually be measured by the number of uncomfortable conversations he or she is willing to have. And, right, it's really about this. It's about the uncomfortable conversations that you are willing to have. Um, and so if I were to move forward with kind of a definition of what I think confrontation might be, at least for the purpose of this talk, is to just say that, right, if we want growth, maybe one of those strategies is confrontation. And if we're looking at confrontation, let's just frame it for a moment as really the uncomfortable conversations um, that we, the, we, we have to be willing to have. Now, unfortunately, this is what confrontation looks like on the internet and in many other places. It's kind of just, it's kind of just sad, I guess. I don't know, it's, and true. So I guess the question, right, is, I mean, if this, if we can all identify with this, then a question we should ask ourselves is, like, why aren't we able to, uh, you know, meet at the other side of the gate, right? Why aren't we able to have that uncomfortable uh, conversation? So I think there's a lot of reasons why. And, you know, there's, um, there's so much space in this. But one thing that I kind of pulled out, um, a sort of pattern that I was observing, um, was that it seemed like we were sort of systemically 
designing away these meaningful opportunities for and like space for these uncomfortable conversations. Um, and when I reflected on kind of the, my experience, personal experience of that, right, it was like, well, here's a moment when, you know, all of us, I, I imagine, have a moment where we're, we're escaping from something, right? We're endlessly scrolling uh, through content, um, whether that's an Instagram feed or what, you know, whatnot. But, um, like, what are we doing in that moment? Are we actively consuming? Are we actively having conversations? Are we avoiding something, right? Are we avoiding a confrontation? Or is this going to actually, you know, is this going to inspire a confrontation in the future, um, you know, based on something that you might see in the feed? And I look at now there is a lot more uh, a conversation that's happening about these products, uh, Facebook being one of them, that are somewhat, you know, designed maybe not intentionally, right, and not intentionally trying to remove the space for these things, but as a result of a thousand decisions, um, maybe metrics that guided those decisions, um, or maybe something more fundamental, we've got platforms that, you know, and, and, and devices, right, um, and we're reaching billions of people, and these systems have somewhat sort of, uh, not only kind of disabled uh, the, the, the space for confrontation, but maybe we don't even realize that we need to you know, intentionally design that back in. Um, I think about, uh, there's a lot of folks now starting to come forward and talk about this. Uh, Tristan Harris, uh, the guy on the right, has been saying a lot. Um, he started a, a number of movements, um, this coalition they're referring to, uh, Time Well Spent, and um, they have a new one that they just formed. Um, to really reach and kind of spread this message and, and reach an audience and say that, you know, like we really need to address this and we need to change kind of fundamentally what these products um, do and, um, and, and address these, these big systemic issues. You see, uh, you know, another, again, a former Facebook exec came out and said, you know, I like the, the quote below, but just essentially that like, it seems like it's ripping society apart of this sort of no civil discourse, no cooperation, misinformation, mistruth. Um, but then I see things like this, and this is, you know, really alarming. Um, there was a CDC report um, that is linking teen depression and suicide to smartphone use. And it is, um, actually have it here, so five or more hours per day on their devices, uh, those teens uh, have a 71% uh, greater chance of having one risk factor for suicide. And that's regardless of the content that they're consuming. So there's something that's an alarming and crazy statistic. Um, and if there's something there that we need to be paying attention to. So I feel like these products are pulling us apart, but maybe in more ways than one, right? Um, and the way that I kind of visualize this is I think that, you know, on an ideal day, we're never going to be completely aligned with people who have different uh, values and different points of view. But I would hope, right, at best, there's a nice kind of set of shared values. We're human, we want to be loved, we want you know, to be enabled, we want to right, self-actualize, all these wonderful things, we want to survive. We have shared values. But these products, what they might be doing slowly over time, or maybe faster and faster as the rate of technology kind of accelerates, right? They start to pull us apart a little bit. And at first it just feels like kind of the shrinking of shared values. Even in this state, I'm okay. Because while we still have a bit of an echo chamber, right, growing on either side, there's still something in the middle, the shared values. And that space is room for us to have a confrontation, right? There's still some common ground that we can, you know, that we can, um, where we can begin. I think what's dangerous is, and I think we're seeing, starting to see this, is a somewhat a detachment from the common ground. It's embracing the more extreme views and the polarizing sides of this that effectively, right, it just pushes us apart until we get to a point where we kind of don't even acknowledge that there is a common ground. And it feels like this, even though I would argue that it's not, right? That we do have that shared and common ground but we've started to become sort of isolated in our points of view. Okay. 
So what do we do? I don't have all the answers, but when I look at this, I think, and I go back to this strategy, this idea that um, maybe confrontation can give us something uh, to work with, some, somewhere, a place to begin. And just to be clear, like, I don't mean be confrontational, right? I'm not talking about starting confrontations. Um, Want to another way of framing it is just essentially like that. What we can do is we can help people develop both this mindset, right, that in embracing sort of that confrontation is a good thing, and over time building the skills uh, to navigate that, uh, to confront that which is difficult, right, to have the uncom uh, uncomfortable conversation, um, and to and to work through it. And when I Return to this quote, I, I remember uh, an insight when I first, when I sort of sat with this, this quote, I had this moment where I thought, um, it, it kind of led to a hypothesis. Okay, so I've never really, you know, are all the people who I've met uh, or seen in the world who are successful as individuals, of all the relationships that I see that are really wonderful and successful, um, the common thread between these people and these relationships uh, is that they're able to navigate conflict, they're able to confront the difficult things, and they're able to work through it together. And so I have a hypothesis that if this is true on the sort of the personal level, then maybe it could hold true in a professional and a business sense. That maybe if we embrace this idea in our products and in our businesses and in our teams, and essentially at all levels, right, if we design for confrontation at all levels, um, that maybe we'll see the same kind of growth uh, that we experience when we do this uh, as individuals and in relationships that are just personal. Okay, so designing for it at all levels, um, these are just a few, and actually I kind of <laughs> reduce this section down to just really one example in each of these, and hopefully in the Q&A, uh, we can talk maybe more about it, but these are the three strategies that um, are right now kind of interesting to me. One, confront your customers, two, confront your colleagues, and then three, ultimately, confront yourself. Um, let's start with this one. So, I work at Airbnb, and I'm really proud of something that we did. Um, I think it was about a year ago. We introduced um, something we call the community commitment. And what this says is this. I agree to treat everyone in the Airbnb community, regardless of their race, religion, national origin, ethnicity, skin color, disability, sex, gender identity, sexual orientation, or age, with respect and without judgment or bias. And you have to accept these terms uh, to join Airbnb to create an account. Now, despite how you feel about that, what's interesting about this is that we confronted our customers in this moment and we said that you have to subscribe to these values, you have to agree to these terms um, to be you know, on Airbnb. And you know, of course there's critique and, um, and I think what's interesting is that if you know about our company, we also talk about belonging, like belonging anywhere, right? This idea that, right, our mission is essentially to create a world in which anyone can belong anywhere. So how do you hold these two ideas together, right? On the one hand, that's what we say, and yet we do something like this. Well, I came across this, um, another wonderful talk I saw that introduced this concept, and it totally made sense. It's a paradox of tolerance. Right? And sometimes the greatest confrontations are kind of rooted in this kind of paradox, so it's important to look at it. But the first sort of idea of this paradox of tolerance is this. One, a, toler a tolerant society must be tolerant. Totally makes sense, right? That's pretty straightforward. The second idea, though, is where the paradox comes in, and that is except with regard to intolerance. Said another way, for tolerant societies to persist, like we must be intolerant of intolerance. And that's a heavy kind of idea, 
Um, this idea actually came up around the time of World War II. A philosopher named Karl Popper came up with this paradox. And it makes sense around that time in that there was a rise of intolerant societies. And if it weren't for the reaction of the more tolerant societies or sort of reacting to this intolerance, um, fighting that war, who knows where we'd be today. Um, and I think what's interesting about that is when we return to this, we're taking a stand, right? We are confronting a really difficult thing, which is one, potentially the success of our business, right? I mean, the moment you confront your customers, that's a scary moment because you're potentially telling them, uh, you, you're potentially um, doing something that might turn them away. Um, in the end, Airbnb is still growing, right? We're still a successful company. Um, and again, I think that I'm extremely proud that we're a company that we, you know, been able to do this. Um, and I think there's a lot, obviously a lot more opportunities for us um, to go beyond even just this notion of tolerance, um, but potentially um, uh, even further. I forgot that I actually inserted this, so I might as well show it. Um, I just thought this was funny. It's, uh, you know, Twitter, you can always find something a little bit snarky, but yeah, a very easy and fun activity is to not let people use your software for racist garbage. Not a bad, uh, not a bad rule to live by. But I think that, um, right, this is, a, um, this is one step toward, through a confrontation, uh, conf confronting our customers, it's a way to set this mindset, right? What is the mindset? In this case, it's a mindset of tolerance. It's also a mindset that, like, yes, a company may confront you with a difficult issue. And why do we do that? We do that because we have strong values, we believe in this, and it's actually in the end for the community and for the people who do uh, join the company, join Airbnb. Um, so I'll leave that there. Um, lots of other examples have been coming across, but I'd love to, again, um, have more discussion around that one. Um, so again, confronting your customers is one thing, but that's extremely difficult. It takes an entire company and you know, it takes your leadership teams, it takes even maybe your board, I'm sure, to align to create that kind of, to kind of you know, have that statement um, go out into the world. And that's challenging. Um, so maybe what we, where we can start is just one step back, the smaller thing, um, which is just kind of like your teams, the people around you, your colleagues. Um, so let's see, by a show of hands, how many of you are avoiding a confrontation right now with somebody at work? A couple of hands. Come on. I definitely have been. Or no? Okay. All right. Well, I think that maybe the first confrontation is that you have to acknowledge that you are avoiding it. I don't know. Maybe that's it. Um, I think that it's really hard to uh, you know, work in these highly collaborative environments, cross-functional teams, uh, people with, you know, uh, really stressful, you know, and aspirational, like, goals, uh, you know, that you need to meet. Um, but I think, kind of going back to this, I think something I've observed is that the teams that can confront each other not only, like, begin here, but they actually, they, right? They, they come together and they strengthen that common ground. And when, they see, when, I, you know, when I see teams or work with teams who have stronger shared values, um, they're unstoppable. I mean, um, they have each other's back and um, they're able to navigate all of the inevitable challenges that arise as you're trying to do the impossible um, or something that you know, is seemingly impossible. Um, one of the things that, again, because this is a the way that I would address, uh, the way I'm trying to look at confrontation is how do you not just one off do, like have a confrontation with this person or that, but how do we systemically design it back in? Um, because in the system, there is resilience. If there is a system, right, then if one piece fails, well, the rest of it might continue. And so one example of this is just something that we call uh, real talk. And it takes many forms. Um, it's something that we've been doing uh, at different levels of our organization. Um, but for me specifically, I believe in uh, doing this with my team um, and just, again, 
doing it regularly on a monthly basis. And it's literally as simple as this. Like as busy as your calendar is, when that event shows up, when you have a real talk session once a month, you know, that is the space that you've systemically designed back in to confront your colleagues. It's really that simple. And we carve out, you know, a couple of hours and it doesn't necessarily take that much time, but um, it's important to have that space, that buffer to feel like, okay, like this is a serious amount of time. Even if we only talk for 30 minutes and there were serious confrontation, that's fine. But, um, right, create the space, create the system um, and start there. And then the role of the person like me in this case, often it's just this, it's just to listen. Um, you know, uh, I think that a confrontation, uh, again, it's an uncomfortable conversation, right? Nobody wants to have it. You're not walking in here being like, all right, I'm ready to have this uncomfortable conversation. So it's important to sort of set this, um, set the stage and just be receptive. Um, and my advice to those who participate in the real talk is just this, like just drink a little bit less coffee and it's amazing what happens. It's actually, uh, no, it's, it's kind of a throwaway joke, but it actually is, uh, this was something that helped me uh, tremendously was switching from like coffee to tea and realizing that like the visceral feelings you get as you sort of build the anticipation of the uncomfortable conversation can be worse than the uncomfortable conversation itself. And we are so just physiological as well as emotional and mental that like you might actually react better to an uncomfortable conversation if you just reduce your caffeine a little bit. So I don't know, just a pro tip, I guess. Um, all right, so that's, you know, I think one strategy for confronting your colleagues. And then lastly, um, and possibly the hardest one, confronting yourself. Um, and so I'm not gonna stand up here and just tell you that you need to confront yourself. I will tell you a little bit about uh, me and me confronting stuff, which I realize I actually didn't swap out the words, so that's the only time I'll say this. But yeah, I tend to avoid shit. I mean, I don't know how many other people in the room might agree with that. I found myself identifying with this person, this, this animated GIF, and um, I think one of the most, um, most interesting moments for me was when um, I decided to not just realize that, yes, this was happening, right? I was avoiding whatever, a confrontation with another person or confronting things that were, you know, um, like things that I was feeling or thinking. Um, but I deliberately said, you know what, I'm going to experiment. As awful as this sounds, I'm going to try some things. Um, I deleted, you know, the Facebook app and I deleted Instagram and Snapchat or whatever. I just got rid of the things that were um, my place to go to endlessly scroll. Um, those especially are the ones that were about like kind of my friends or the social, uh, the social circles where I felt like I had to do something or be someone and when that, the word sort of should, I should be, I should do, kept creeping in. Um, I removed those things and I experimented with that. And what I found was that when you sit there and you're not doing this, genuinely, like this question comes up, which was a hard question for me to answer, or even ask, I'd say, a hard question for me to ask when I was endlessly scrolling. Because I had so many inputs, I had so many things giving me options, endless options, that I wasn't even asking myself what I wanted to do in this moment. And it's been wonderful, um, painful at times and challenging, but I also realized that like, here I am as a designer looking for the next big problem, I can't wait to solve like a huge impactful problem. And yet sitting there and asking myself, well, what do I want to do with this moment? Or what do I want to do with my life? Or whatever, however big or small it became. What I realized was, whoa, this is probably just the 
biggest and most amazing creative opportunity I have. Um, and yet I've been avoiding that because I'm looking at, you know, this other really important thing, it's still important to me. Um, but it's been it took so much, so much of the space um, that I never really even got to, to get to this point. Um, and this is actually from the book, The Subtle Art of Not Giving an F. I'll say that now. Um, not giving a fuck, can I say that? All right. Um, he says, the pain of honest confrontation is what generates the greatest trust and respect in your relationships. And obviously, I think this holds true not only for your relationships with other people, your relationships with your colleagues, your relationships with your customers, um, but obviously um, with yourself. So these are three and just a few examples of these three strategies. Um, but I will leave you with this, this question, which is, you know, does my hypothesis hold true? Does, would designing for confrontation in a systemic way um, not only um, help individuals, including yourself, grow, uh, the relationships that you have grow, um, but could they also, could by designing for confrontation in a systemic way, could we also influence and help your product grow and your company and the business success grow as well? Um, so my ask of you is to pick something, anything, and it can be personal and it can be uh, related to you know, your product, your team, your company, and confront it and then share your stories with me. And I genuinely mean that. I am still trying to figure out what's happening in this space. I you know, uh, was even a little bit nervous about sharing something that didn't feel like it was complete and you know, perfect. Um, but it's a question that um, I'm personally interested in. And if you do this and you do confront something, I would love to hear from you. So you can hit me up here. Thank you.